translation surfaces and lots of geometric pictures. From today, I think we'll abandon the um, geometric aspects and we will move to more combinatorics and dynamics. So um, I want to move to, so first I want to kind of solve one of the exercises, the first exercise that I gave um, yesterday. So let me remind you that yesterday we were looking at these polygons which have opposite parallel sides glued together by translations. And we said that they give us a translation surface, a surface which is locally flat. And we can talk about linear flow. We can move in a direction using the identification. We have a flow which moves in a straight line on the surface. And uh, today we want to do what many people in dynamics do when they have a flow. Many times it's convenient to go to maps. We saw it already last week. We saw it already for the square. We can take a section and induce, uh, sorry, already did the wrong session. Say so, uh, the section is some interval which is transverse to your flow. And uh, it could be different, it could be shorter, it could, if the flow is minimal, uh, every transverse segment will be hit sooner or later. Uh, let me show you the solution of the exercise. I say that I want to induce my linear flow on this uh, section over there. And uh, uh, I need the, uh, uh, here, I need the, uh, you have maybe a slightly different picture in the, in the homework. So what happens? So if I start from some point on my section here, it depends on where the point is. So if the point is in this blue area, what happens when I flow? I, I flow, and then B is glued with B, and I come back in this blue area below. I think if you did the exercise, you, I'm just, it's a really, I'm just showing the solution. So if you have a point here in the yellow area, for example, it hits C, and then it travels with C, and it comes back on the image of C. So these uh, colors represent uh, straight lines which travel together and return together, okay? So if you draw this map, from the section to the section, and the section is, let's say, normalize it to be 0, 1. You see that your map uh, is, does the following. It cuts your interval into four parts, which are the uh, points under A, under B, under C, under D. And, uh, for example, little a comes back, little a I didn't do, B comes back here, C comes back. So each come back translated in a different part of your section. Okay, so the map is continuous, it's actually an isometry on each of these intervals, but it's globally discontinuous. So there are four continuity intervals and three discontinuity points, okay? And this is, these are the maps we will treat today. So we will abandon the polygons and go to the world of interval exchange maps. That's what this type of maps uh, that we now define. And let me remark that if, for example, if you are interested in cutting sequences and your flow, it shows your section nicely, like here, if you wanted to understand the cutting sequence of a linear trajectory in the polygon, in this case, you can reduce to study the interval exchange map and code the trajectory of this map by an itinerary, so you can record whether I enter A, B, C, or D, and if you record this itinerary, it will give you the cutting sequence, like in the square. So in some sense, if cutting sequences can be reduced to, to a coding of this type of maps. Okay? So that was my motivation. And now let me uh, start with interval exchange map. So IET stays for interval exchange map. Uh, interval change transformation, thank you, yes. Actually, there are, I think classically it's called transformation, your codes like to write uh, maps. Now I get into the, uh, the your codes move. So sometimes it's also interval exchange, your codes would write IEM for interval exchange maps. <laughs> thank you for pointing out. Okay, so these are uh, 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 bijective, so I mean, first let me say informally, they are bijective piecewise, piecewise isometries. So they are one-to-one, -one 
and they are uh, piecewise isometries of 0, 1. I will give a definition more formal in a second. But first, let me fix something. So if I have, let me fix, uh, I will define what is, um, I will fix a, 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 an alphabet. Uh, so first of all, if I want an interval exchange of D intervals, for example, uh, in our example, D was four. It's actually nice to give names to the in intervals with letters. So uh, before I give you the definition, let me say I will fix a, a, an alphabet. Made by D symbols, the cardinality of this alphabet in D. And in our example, our alphabet is A, B, C, D. And I will call I alpha, I will use the letter alpha in the alphabet, the continuity intervals. So it's piecewise continuous, and I will call I alpha the continuity intervals of the map. So for example, I A, I B, I C, and I D. Now I want to say this before giving you the definition, so you can think of alphabet this. Okay, let's do it like this. Definition. T from 0, 1 to 0, 1 is a DIT. D is the number of intervals. It's a DIT. If there exist um, intervals I alpha, and sometimes it's also nice to have a name for the endpoint, so I call them U alpha, V alpha. And I want to take them semi-open. Just to, you could choose another convention. You can do them semi-open to the last. Ah, actually, 0, 1, let me do it like this. 0, 1, open to 0, 1, open. And I take my interval semi-open. If there exists I alpha, where alpha varies in my alphabet, such as that, I can partition 0, 1 in this interval. So 0, 1 is the union of I alpha, the union alpha in alpha or alpha, and this is a disjoint union, so it's a partition. And T restricted to I alpha, which maps I alpha to the image of I alpha, is a translation so I partition my segments in interval and each interval is translated by a certain amount so something of the form x goes in x plus some delta alpha some displacement and you want of course that the images don't overlap I want a one-to-one -one map so I want that the images again and the union in alpha of T of I alpha is again equal to 0, 1. And this is again a disjoint union. Okay. So I cut in intervals each, I move by a translation, and together they reassemble to form 0, 1. I think it's very, very clear. And uh, let me tell, me tell you that you already know one example. So if you take a two IT, two ITs, these are rotations. We already saw last week that I can open up my circle and a rotation actually looks like an exchange of two intervals, okay? Uh, one minus R, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Emmy is very good at spotting typos. I'm sure many other people are good at spotting typos, but they don't shout out. So you have to become as brave as Amy, who always asks when she doesn't understand or when she wants people to understand. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me make a silly remark, but 
So I want you, um, maybe, maybe that. this will be an exercise. So the first mistake that people do when they say an interval exchange, they think, oh, but these maps are periodic because I permute my intervals and then they come back to be the same. No, if the lengths are not rational, for sure, intervals, when you want to do the iterate of an IT, you have to be careful that an interval will move and then might be broken up again at the next iterate. So let me urge you to, 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 to do this exercise. So I want to say that t to the n, the nth t, to t composed with t and times, uh, is an, again an IT, is also an IT, but in general of more intervals. So I'll just ask you to play with drawing some iterates. And actually, typically, uh, this will be at most d minus 1 times n plus 1. And I will ask you to compute this number. And let me give you a hint for this exercise. So as you inter in in apply iterates, you have to chop your intervals into smaller and smaller bits. So you really have to just draw an interval exchange and draw the square and draw the cube to convince you. And let me just say, so you can remark if you have a smaller subinterval, let's call J A B contained in, in 0, 1. If you have a smaller subinterval, so you need this remark. Uh, I, of course, I forgot the order. So, okay, then let me do it now. So, take a subinterval. I want to look what are the discontinuity points of my interval exchange. So, the discontinuity. Discontinuity points of t are the middle points of the intervals, right? So these are the sets, I call them u alpha, u alpha, alpha in alpha, maybe minus zero, because u alpha were my left end points, so all left end points are breakpoints but zero. These are the discontinuities of t. are the breakpoints. And now my remark is that if j, t of j, dot, 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 t to the n minus 1 of j, don't all don't intersect. All don't intersect the discontinuity set. If you don't hit the discontinuity, then t to the n restricted to j is continuous. So your points travel together unless they end in a break point when they are cut and split. So the hint when you want to compute uh, the iterates, so the hint for the exercise is consider pre-images. <coughs> consider pre, that's almost a solution. Consider pre-images of discontinuities. Okay, To find continuity intervals for t to the n. And now I need a little bit more uh, notation. So are you OK so, so far? So now I want a little bit more notation. So to give, to give, to give you an IT, a DIT, I need to tell you two things. I need to tell you what are the lengths of the intervals, and I need to tell you how I permute them. Okay, so to give an IT, you need two things, length and length, length datum, length. So length, what would be length? Length will be a vector, will be collection lambda alpha. And this will be the length, this where lambda, let me write already, lambda alpha will be the length of the interval, the bag length of the interval I alpha. 
And this is a vector which you want to have positive entries and add up to one. So let me call belongs to delta D. So these are uh, the set of uh, uh, delta D, so the set of lambda alpha in R plus to the D. So all of them have to be non-negative. And the sum has to add up to one. So this is called the simplex. Well, you just want positive numbers which add up to one. So for example, if you have three intervals, the length, if this is length of A, this is length of B, and this is length of C, you want that the sum is equal to one. So you're kind of looking at the face of a simplex in R3. That's what this means. And then you, know, you need a permutation. Of the alphabet. Uh, actually, you need a permutation. And I don't want to do too much notation because my time is short. So let me just say, I will record the permutation like this. I will write two rows. And in one, I write the letters of the intervals on top. And here, I write the letters of the interval on the bottom. For example, there, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. OK? And let me write anything else. So I use letters. And it's nice that these letters are kind of names for the intervals. So they don't have to be in this order, A, B, C, D. They could be in any order in the first row and in any order of the second row. And now I'll tell you something. When interval exchanges was first written, people would just write 1, 2, 3, 4 goes to 4, 3, 2, 1. And it was actually your cause, who is a Fields medalist who also proved lots of things of circle diffield, who said, no, no, let's keep track of, let's give names to intervals and let's write a row of names that could be scrambled. And actually, it's really nice to have names for intervals because when we will do induction, like we will do soon, you want to follow what a single interval does. And if you like, for example, cutting sequences, you may believe that you want to follow what happens to the interval A. And A might move around. So it's nice to use this notation. And now, uh, OK, so I want to make an assumption, which is a standing assumption on the permutation. Standing assumption. And my standing assumption is that the permutation is irreducible. And I'll tell you what this means. I, uh, let me give you first an example. So I don't want something like this, C, B, A, D. If I have a permutation where there is a block, I don't want any initial block of letters which are permuted among themselves. OK? Irreducible, yeah, no initial block. So this is no want no. You don't want no initial block of letters permuted among themselves. I'm not very formal, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Permuted among Unless, of course, it's the whole. No initial block of letters of lengths of length less than D. Sorry? Yeah, OK. So this is what irreducible means. Why I don't want that? Well, independently on the length, if I have a situation like this, I can cut my interval in two parts, and the first three play by themselves. So I can reduce my interval exchange to a smaller one. It's clear that I want this to be non three to say something non-trivial. Huh?
Ah, you want uh, and then strip? Uh, so. No, that's fine. So I'm not, uh, no, I'm just saying that so the permutation will still, uh, if the permutation mixes the letters, you can have uh, what, what is called a connection point. You can have a common discontinuity between the two partitions. But for example, it's a very good exercise. If you can try to prove you have these two rotations that kind of swap side, this interval exchange, you can prove it's minimal. So orbits are dense. So it's not kind of trivial in some sense. But that's, that's no, that's not what you said. Yes. Yes. But then, each, then I mean reducible because the first two play with each other and the second two play. So any initial blocking, I draw three, but you could have any AA or you could have ABBA. Any initial block, which is not everything, which is permuted by themselves, I want to exclude. But you could do two rotations which kind of swap with each other or maybe one piece. And that is, could be, okay, now that's for me. Okay, so uh, what did I want to say? So maybe let me say what is my definition as a definition of when I will say almost every IT, of almost every IT, so there is a space of ITs, maybe almost every DIT. For me, this means equal any pi irreducible. And almost every Lebesgue, almost every length vector in the simplex. Okay, so that's what almost every mean. <coughs> so, uh, where are we? So, uh, Lebesgue, what does it mean? There is a Lebesgue measure in RD. So the Lebesgue measure on RD induces a Lebesgue measure on a hypersurface. This is like the, the, where length is equal to one. So you put Lebesgue measure on this uh, hypersurface. That almost every choice of length which add up to one. Okay, so first, there's one thing that I want to tell you but not do. So this is the theorem. You can ask, for example, like we did in the rotation, when will orbits be dense? So when will my uh, IT be minimal, and I will give you a result by Keen. It's actually not the stronger form, but it's okay. So if the length pi is irreducible from now on, if I don't say it, pi is irreducible always. If the lengths are linearly independent, rationally independent, rationally independent, then T is minimal, which means that for every point uh, in zero, 01, the orbit, forward orbit under the interval exchange is dense. So if you want corollary, almost every IET is minimal. So I don't want to go into this uh, because I want to go towards um, other ergodic properties. But uh, uh, this is actually a theorem which is quite elementary to prove. And they can give you a reference. There is uh, there are some lecture notes of your cause or some lecture notes of Yana. It's actually half a page, and it's not too difficult to prove. But uh, I think there is an, it's nicer to think about it in terms of flows on surfaces. So if you think on the surface, so you can kind of better see what happens. There are some strips which cannot come back, uh, OK, which cannot close up. And then you can, you can, I think it's nicer geometrically. And it's not very enlightening to see it on the interval exchange level. So. I want to state two more results about interval exchanges, so which I want to give you a flavor of. Uh, one I will prove, and one I will give you some flavor of, and I want to go into the techniques. So, say this is theorem one. So remember what we did for rotations. For rotation, we knew that they are um, 
uh, vile theorem. We knew that they are uniquely ergodic. So it's natural to ask whether there are, if these uh, interval exchanges will also be uniquely ergodic. So th this is a really big result, the first kind of in, it's from the 80s. It's a result from which and independently, Mesur. I think it's two papers on annals back to back in the 80s. And it was a conjecture by Keane, Keane's conjecture. That almost every, almost every means always that, almost every IT is uniquely ergodic. So we did unique ergodicity uh, last week. We did a lot on ergodicity. Uniquely ergodic means that there exists a unique invariant measure. What is the obvious invariant measure? What is an invariant measure for an IT? What is an invariant measure for the rotation? Huh? Le, yes. So IETs, maybe I should have said it at the beginning, they are piecewise isometries. So what is an invariant measure? They preserve Lebesgue. Maybe you should try to. So only Lebesgue is the only invariant measure. I don't think David proved it, but at least David said it. Once you are uniquely ergodic, you are automatically ergodic with respect to that unique invariant measure. Okay? And uh, uh, I will state yet another theorem, theorem three. And this is also quite an old result by Katok in the 80s, also, 82, maybe I don't remember, maybe I don't know, let's say 80s. Actually, IETs are not, not uh, mixing. Sorry, and this is actually, uh, this is not an almost everywhere, so no, so IETs are never mixing, so no IET is actually mixing, okay? Not almost every, but any. So, so, so far it might look that interval exchanges really generalize, um, generalize rotations. So rotations also are minimal, uniquely ergodic, never mixing. Actually, IETs are, uh, much, uh, much different than the rotations. For example, uh, maybe I will just put this as a remark, uh, because I don't think we defined weak mixing, because, but maybe some of you might have heard, so maybe let me put it as an aside. It's also true that almost every IET is weak mixing, which rotations are not. It's something in between mixing and ergodicity. And this is a much more recent result by Arthur Avila and Giovanni Forni. And it's one of the results, maybe 2002, I don't know. Arthur Avila won the Fields Medal, and this is one of the works which is also enumerated for his Fields Medal. But, so maybe let me say. And also, there exist IETs which are minimal but not uniquely ergodic. <clears throat> so this is not the case for rotations. So for rotation, we have a dichotomy. I mean, remember at the lecture one, even lecture two, we did either you are uh, periodic or you are uniquely ergodic. So essentially, uh, as soon as you're minimal, you're also uniquely ergodic. These are rare, these are measure zero, but they are still rich. So uh, why did I put on the board these results all together? So actually the proof, apart from Keen, so the proof of theorem two, theorem three, and these other two results all use renormalization. You can, well, uh, you can also prove to your, at least which proof of this result, Mesur has a more geometric proof, but which is proof of this? This proof and these two proofs all use uh, renormalization. So main tool, uh, renormalization through, uh, let me write like this, Rosevich renormalization. 
And that's the tool I want to explain. Okay. And today, and maybe in some part of tomorrow, we'll see, we will start, we do this renormalization procedure. And then I, I, I promise I can prove that IETs are not mixing. And maybe I can say some things uh, about uh, unique ergodicity in a baby case, in a special case. And there are many more results that you can prove. Maybe I can say something about deviations or ergodic average. There are lots and lots of, and actually this is used a lot by in, even in modern, I mean, current results. And it's one of the tools that I've used the most in my own research. And sometimes I don't study linear flows on translational surfaces, but I try, I study smooth area preserving flows on surfaces. And the Poincare sessions of smooth area preserving flows on surfaces in suitable coordinates are also interval exchange maps. And you can still study a lot of ergodic theory for this area preserving flows using this tool here for IETs. So IETs don't only appear in linear flows, they also appear in uh, more generally in smooth area preserving flows on surfaces. Okay, okay. I want to make first another remark or another, maybe a recall maybe you recall from who was here last week, if I give you a subinterval J contained in 0, 1, maybe, I can define Tj, I will call Tj the induced map of T on J. So maybe I should say, from now on, I also assume, I also assume uh, always pi irreducible. And from now on, I will also assume that the lengths are rationally independent. So I have minimality. Okay? So I can define the induced map or first return map this is also called first return map. And let me recall you for who wasn't here. So Ty is a map, sorry, Tj is a map from J to J. And Tj of x is equal to T to the Rx of x. So what do I want to do? Sorry, I have a small interval. I should draw the picture before. I have a small interval, and I take a point here. It maybe maps out of my interval with my interval exchange, but my orbit is dense, so I come back to y. So I want to look at the first return time that I come back and accelerate my map. So tj is equal to a power of t, t to the rx of x, where and now I have the problem that maybe someone doesn't write, where R of x is the minimum of the integers such that Tn of x belongs to J. This is the first return. Say it again. Ah, it's, should I write it again over there? Yes, good point. I think people who are here, I think most people in this room, I did return maps last week, but there are many new people who maybe are familiar with the Nomica system. So Tj of x is equal to T to the R, maybe you can also call it Rj of x. I'll say it about, okay. And Rj of x is the minimum, I'm assuming minimal, so there is an n, minimum n greater or equal than one, such that Tn of x is back in j. And of course, x was in j, as defined on j. So I take a point in my small interval and iterate my map until I'm back in j, okay? And now I have another exercise for you. 
I, you really, I really want you to do some pictures of ITs and play with IT a little bit, otherwise you will not, um, it's not possible to, to follow if you don't play with IT. So this is why exercises are so important. You need to sit down and do things yourself to really understand. So I want to say uh, X, so for any J in, so, okay, okay. Any, in, okay, PJ, any PJ of this form, TJ is again an IT, is again an, maybe you would believe this, it's an interval exchange map of, and in this case, the number of intervals for powers, it was growing, but here it can only be at most D plus two intervals. And you can try to convince yourself why there could be something worse from inducing. This is relating to the endpoint. So when you come back, you may be unlucky, and at some point, your interval comes back and hits the endpoint of J. And then there is some additional breaking point, which doesn't come from these continuities, but come from, from. Uh, uh. And do you remember, if you were here last week, I asked you to do an exercise. If you take a rotation and induce it on any interval, the induced map is an interval exchange of three intervals. You see that in that case, you can have one more. For example, you have to start from a two IT, you get a three IT. So that exercise was preparatory for this. But we also saw last week that if induce a rotation, if I choose my intervals carefully, if I induced on these nice arcs, I actually get again two IT, I get again rotations. Sorry? So if you choose your interval carefully, you can actually get D. So you can get D, D plus one, or D plus two. But if you're careful, you can get D. And this is exactly what I want to do. So now I want an induction algorithm. Which does the following. I want to produce a sequence I n, n in n of nested intervals. So I n plus one is contained in I n. Sequence of nested intervals. And actually, they will look like this. So I zero will be zero one. And my next intervals with the rotation, we were chopping from the right and chopping from the left, alternatively. Here we will actually only, we will keep zero fixed and just shorten our interval from the right. So they will look like this. I1 is contained in I0, has zero as a common endpoint. And then at some point you get to IN. They will shrink towards zero from the right. And so on. So I will induce around zero from the right. And these intervals will be chosen so that the definition is such that if t to the n, so I will call t to the n will be t to the i n. t to the n will be the induced map. on I n, and I want this to be a D I T for every n. Sorry. Okay, so I want to choose my intervals smartly so that um, I get again an IT of two intervals. And in some sense, again, if you were here last week, you remember what we did with the rotation. We were choosing our interval to be some closest returns. And in some sense, we were looking at the next closest returns. They were shrinking to zero. And those intervals were exactly intervals were inducing I had the two IT, a rotation at every stop. And in some sense, they were all intervals 
so that when I induce, I get a 2IT and not a 3IT. They were all special intervals. So this algorithm will, is made to produce all special intervals where you have DIT and not D plus 2 ITs. And I want to do one step. I want to do it today. So one step. So set, set I0 is equal to 0, 1, and T0 equal to T. And I want to do one step from N. Say that I defined n, I want to define n plus 1. The, the n's one, one step. So this is what we do. I look at this is i n, and this is t to the n, and it's some interval exchange map a, b, c. And if you draw something, draw the last interval very large and larger than A. So I'm going to put A, B, C, a very long D, and then I'm going to put uh, uh, D, C, B, A, for example. You could do other combinatories, like D, C, B, and A. Okay? So, and actually I will put up the picture that I have here also. So if you don't want to draw pictures, which maybe it's a good idea now to listen without drawing, I give you a later, uh, what is the thing? Where do I click? Oh, I click here. Okay, so I give, you a, I give you this picture in the slides so you can just look at the picture. So what do I want to do? So this algorithm has two cases and the cases are, depend on the last interval. So I want to look the last interval in my interval partition before uh, the exchange and compare it with the last interval before after the exchange. So compare, compare, compare last interval before and after. And let's give it name. Let's call alpha top, alpha t, so this is top and bottom, alpha t uh, such that i alpha t is last. In my example, alpha top is d, the last letter is d. And alpha bottom such that t of e alpha bottom is last after the exchange. So here, alpha bottom is A. Okay. Okay. So you look at the two intervals and you look which one is larger. And then you, there are two cases. So there is the top case. And the top case is if the top interval is bigger. So, so lambda alpha top is longer than lambda alpha bottom. And in this case, you say that alpha top is the winner. The winner is the bigger, yes? Yeah, so I look at my intervals after the interval exchange. So I look at the images. And this is the interval which after applying t is last. So look at the picture. A will become last. So t, oh, did I say it wrong? T is last. Yes, it's last if you want. It contains the endpoint 1, another way to say it. Alpha bottom. So this is alpha. Maybe my letters are not so good. So there is alpha t for top and b for bottom. So this is the last in the top row, and this is the last in the bottom row. Does it make sense? Is it clear to everybody? So look in this picture. I compare D above with A below. And look which of the two is longer. In my picture, D wins over A because it's longer. OK? Otherwise, bottom, if lambda, the top is less than the bottom, and in this case, alpha bottom is winner. 
and the other is the loser. And then you want to induce, you want to define, okay, let me, let me change it. So what do I want to do now? Now I want to um, cut, uh, this is my example, I want to cut, uh, cut the loser, cut the shorter. So I want to make my interval shorter by uh, the uh, smaller interval. So let, let's do it in an example. Say uh, top case, I want to set i n plus 1 to be equal to i n minus uh, uh, t of uh, minus, uh, maybe let me write it like this. It's the interval from 0 to the length of i n minus the length of the loser, which is alpha bottom. Right. So it's in my picture. I chop out the smaller, and I set t to the n plus 1 induced map on i n plus 1. So let's try to do it in the example, and maybe I will, maybe I'll use the picture above. So where am I, oh sorry, where am I? So it's now my interval is shorter, so this part of space doesn't exist anymore. And I have to look at the first return map to the smaller interval. So what happens, if I look at the B, B is back in my space in one iterate. If I move B, I'm back. If I move C, I'm back. If I move this beginning of D, the beginning of D is immediately back. What happens of the end of D? Uh, uh, so sorry, sorry, sorry. The beginning of D is back. What happens of A? A, if I apply my interval exchange, it moves out of my space. So I really urge you, there's no other way to want, you really should try to think of this picture. I think there's no point that I try. You really, I will give you a stare at this picture and redo it in a piece of paper. So A goes out. So I need to apply T another time to come back. So every, I have to, then I think A is, travels with D if I apply again. So if A travels again with D, this will be my return map. A will go out and come back with D to the end, ending of D. So I fit it here. And I urge you to try to meditate on this picture. And maybe I can say one more thing. What happens now I have a new interval exchange. And if you want, I can record new lengths and new data. So the permutation has changed. So you see here I had A, B, C, D goes in D, C, B, A. Now I have A, B, C, D goes in D, A, C, B. Fine. There is a combinatorial description of how permutations change, but I don't want to explain it. You can just, there is an algorithmic way to understanding them. What I want to say that I can keep track of how length changes, how the new length vector. So three lengths of the new IT are the same. B, C, A, B. Ah, uh, this is wrong. Oh, stupid me. Okay, sorry, I correct the typo. A, B, and C have the same length that they had before, but D is changed. And how is D changed? The old D is now the sum of the new D and the new A. Okay? So all letters are the same by, and you can, re, sorry, and you record, you can record this with the matrix. So I can write the new lengths, the, I can, actually I, I want the positive matrix, so I write the old lengths as a matrix times the new lengths, and you can verify that this matrix is uh, identity, and then there is an extra piece out of the diagonal, which uh, it's actually in a position related to the top and the, the winners and the loser. And okay, so you have a matrix with ones and zeros, which tell you how the length changes. And uh, I leave you the slide for the other case. So this is a similar case. Bottom here uh, is where uh, the bottom interval is longer. So I need to cut the shorter interval. And again, I need to induce. And this one, maybe you can reflect a little bit more. So B is back, C is back immediately. The beginning of A is back immediately. 
but the end of A goes out. So I need to iterate it again. I need to take D and map follow it. So I A, the end, the, sorry, the end of A, we, I will call it D. It goes out, follows D, and is back here. This is a little bit more complicated, but so try to, if you want to really understand, try to look at this picture and redo them yourself. So you have like an exercise with solution. And again, you can record the new permutation and you can record the new length. And again, all the lengths as a function of this new length is a, given by a matrix with one, one, ones and a one, one extra diagonal. So this is, I did finish what I wanted to tell you for today. And I don't want to go into too much details of the algorithm and you can, but I just, if you try to redo this exercise, you will play with interval exchanges and inducing an interval exchange on a subinterval. okay? And then tomorrow we'll try to tell you what can you do with this algorithm and how can you use it.